morning. Morning Jammu Kashmir, morning India, morning students, morning audience. Okay, um, this morning a friend asked me, how are we feeling? Ready, all set, and I'm like, I'm nervous. And you're like, you've done this before, why are you nervous? I'm like, it's good to be nervous because when you feel alive, you're awake more than anything else. And I said, I don't know how I'm going to do this because I really didn't prep for this. You know, we normally prep for a lot of talks and, you know, have a content. I don't have a content because I, have, I am my own content right now for this because uh, I'm basically standing on the edge of something that's an abyss. It's like an edge of a cliff. And you want to take a dive into the water. It's beautiful. And you want to go for a swim, but you want to dive down. And you're just standing on the edge of a cliff and you're scared because it's really deep. And that's the fear of diving. But when you dive, there are two things that can happen and you have to look at it that way. You can't let fear freeze you there, but you dive. So either it's going to be a great dive and you're going to really enjoy the swim, or like somebody said, you're going to fly. There is no third thing. It's just you stopping yourself from experiencing that feeling of diving down, feeling the thrill of diving down. So, today my topic basically is on getting out of your comfort zone. When we talk about innovation, where does it really start? It starts here. It starts here. And it starts here. So you, you, you start with innovation, not with looking outside, but pushing outside. You're starting with innovation by innovating yourself, by reinventing yourself. And that starts with you, with the reinvention, a rebirth of sorts. And you don't have to wait for a, a moment or a murat, what you call in Hindi, uh, to start. It's not the right time. It's a Tuesday, it's a Saturday. We have a lot of these things here. And I grew up in that same environment. I'm from the state. I studied here. I did my graduation from here. And then I had to break out from here. But just one story is not your only story. You have tons of, tons of opportunities that keep coming to you. Most of us are scared of taking up those opportunities because we believe that I'm not qualified to do that. What if I don't do that? What if? But more than the what if, what we tend to face when we're growing up, especially in the Indian society, is why? I want to do this, but why? My question normally is, why not? What's stopping you? So it's always about what will other people say, what will the society say, um, what is your family going to talk about? It's never been done before. But then everybody is extraordinary. Every single person sitting in the audience, including myself, we are all extraordinary because we're unique. And when we're unique people, why do you want to be somebody else? Why do you want to copy somebody else? So if somebody comes up to me, oh, you look like so and so. No, I don't want to know that. I am me. I look like me. So here's my first story. My first story is about getting over the fear of being here on the stage and talking. So I go back to 1994 at the Naval Academy. Now, the thing about being in the services and training for the services is you cannot say no. So that's the problem there. And that's the opportunity there. So I had a cadet come up to me and this was about, we had two squadrons in the academy, just a bit brief background. So one was the destroyer squadron, one was the frigate. And I was, I was in the destroyer squadron. And we had something called the dramatics competition. Everything is a competition because you're trying to excel and you're trying to compete against each other, but you're also competing against your own fears. So he comes up to me and he says, hey, we're doing this play. 
Uh, the other team is doing The Merchant of Venice, which is like a big deal because it's Shakespeare. But we are doing this thing called The King and I. I'm not so sure how many of you have watched this. Anna and the King or The King and I, it's about a king in Thailand who wants his sons to be taught, the princes to be taught uh, by an English person. And then there's this housekeeper, uh, there's this uh, tutor who comes in to teach them English. And he comes up to me and he says, you have to play the role of, of Anna. Now, Anna is one of the, the main characters in the play. And I said, no way. That's not happening. I have never been on stage, especially in a play, ever in my life. I've been on stage, yes, in school. When again, it was a forcible thing, but I would always hide in the background. Because I thought, oh my God, people are going to laugh at me. And I said, no, not happening. I said, you've got seven other women to pick from, or six others, because there were, yeah, seven in each squadron. And he said, you have six more people to pick from, why are you picking me? And he said, because you have the accent. I can't have somebody speaking in a South Indian accent for a person who plays the role of a British uh, girl who comes and teaches English to the prince. And I was like, not happy. So anyway, they said, you don't have a choice. Nobody's asking you to say no, I'm just giving you the script. So I got handed a script of about 20 pages, or maybe more or less. And it had all these dialogues, the entire script. And he said, you have to memorize your dialogues. Now, two things were happening at that point. I was wearing glasses. I went for a plastic surgery, so that's the reason why I'm not wearing glasses today, and I can see everybody in the audience. I used to wear glasses. And the rehearsals were on. We got about 10 days to prepare. I would memorize my dialogues, which was really tough because I hate memorizing things. I hate rattling off exactly what was on the script. Prime reason that there's no presentation here today. So I, uh, I memorized it. I would have nightmares about it at night. I had to go on stage and do this entire thing rattle of dialogues and also uh, express in certain manners the mannerisms of a British you know, tutor and get on with that. So the rehearsals are going on, there are about five, seven the kids sitting there, my divisional officer sitting in front and God help him, I mean he went through a lot with me. <laughs> and then there's Satana and I was directing the play and uh, you know, you have cadets have very short hair, but I think he was pulling off whatever was there you know, on his head. Because I would forget my dialogues all the time because I was so nervous. I would look at people in front of me and I'd be like, oh my god, what am I going to do? And then some wise person told me, they said, you know what, just pretend everybody sitting in front of you is not wearing clothes. <laughs> I was like, what? I said, just pretend. So you know you have an advantage. So I was like, uh -uh, that's not going to work. So I tried. So a day before the program, I was still forgetting my lines. Everybody sitting in for the rehearsal was like, we're going to watch this one up because of this girl. And I had that pressure, the stress, the, the responsibility of doing this right and not getting it right. Because I forgot my lines. Every time I'd look at somebody's watching me, oh my god, somebody's watching me. This is what I would do. Final day, D day. And I go and it's a packed hall. The hall is as big as this and it's packed with people. And now I'm wondering what am I going to do? Because I'm going to watch this up and then I'm going to be punished for this forever. The entire term that I'm there in the academy, I will not hear the end of it. So then I thought about it. And I realized the fear that I had was people staring at me. So I took off my glasses. I was blind, <laughs> literally, because I couldn't see anyone. And because I couldn't see anyone, I began to enjoy the process. I enjoyed the process. I remembered my lines. I remembered everybody's lines. I covered up for anybody who forgot their lines. And we did it. So that was my first fear. I threw out of the window with my glasses. Of course. Thank you. In the
process, what happened was, I banged my knee against the bench because we were running behind, you know, coming out from one side, coming out from the other side. Uh, it was all worth it. Story number one. Story number two was my comfort zone. Now, this is practical stuff. Now, this is not so practical stuff about bringing out your thoughts, your dreams, and your opinions out into the open. I write poetry. I studied English literature. And I graduated from uh, Government College Parade in Jammu, from Jammu University. And literature was one of my subjects. So, you know, everything you're, you're taught structure, you're taught metrics, you're taught uh, synthesis, you're taught, uh, you know, uh, syllables, a lot of things in poetry. Just poetry, if, you, if I pick it. So, for me, poetry was about expression more than anything else. And this is the way I got down to write stuff. So, a friend of mine, Arthi, started an online, uh, she was working with an online magazine and she needed content and she pushed us to write something. The first poem I'd written was, in my life, was in the eighth grade, thanks to a teacher, uh, Ms. Reema Mehra. She was about 21 and we were kids, we were teenagers, and she said, you know, write. And I wasn't a great student at that point, and she kind of, uh, she ingrained that love for the language for me, and I started writing. So that first poem was written then, and uh, she loved it, and it went in the school magazine. I don't have a copy of that anymore, but I know I had that poem with me anyway. It was written and scrawled up, and I found it years later. So getting back to Arthi's magazine, I wrote a poem again. And I was going through a really bad phase of my life at that point. So I started expressing my pain in my writing. So now what you're doing is you're opening yourself, you're exposing yourself. You're jumping into a territory you don't know. And then I realized when I'm writing about pain, I'm having unknown people in my life coming back to me, reaching back to me and says, I so get that because I'm going through this. So people had fears, people had emotional fears, people had emotional barriers to break up from, and they found a reason or a place where they could read it and identify themselves with what was going on in their lives. And that's when I started seriously writing. I couldn't think up things. I don't program my poetry. It just comes. But I've allowed it to be. And over the years, I've realized I started writing for somebody to read it. Now I've come to a stage where I just write. Somebody wants to read it and derive something out of it. It's up to them. But I just write. So what's the point of all this? The point is that we restrict ourselves in a bubble and say this is what my life is going to be. Why? Because this is how it is designed, it has been designed. I have woken up one fine day, I am born into a family and whatever the family wants me to do, I will do it because that is how it has been done. So most of the students in India especially end up studying the subjects their parents want them to study. This is something I picked up yesterday as well. And I identify with it. Sometimes it's about the choices you have in a certain place of education. Most of the parents won't even send their children out of the state or out of town to study because they're too scared. What if, what if, what if, what if, and there's no end to it. What will people say? Why are you traveling alone? Travel. Get out. Get out, break out of your fear because the world is absolutely amazing. And if you do not give an opportunity to yourself, you will not know how amazing you can be. And each of you can do something absolutely amazing. You may think it's very ordinary what you want to do. It's not, trust me. There are billions of people out there and there will always be somebody who needs what you have to give to the world. There is always someone and they will find you because they are seeking you out. It's not the other way. But for you, you have to be able to transform yourself. And transformation is not only for people around you. It is an internal need to break out into the open. I'm not saying 
throw away everything in your life and step out and say, hey, now I'm free, I can fly. No. Throw away your fears. Don't throw away your passion. Don't throw away what makes you tick. Don't throw away your passion. Don't throw away your talent. Don't throw away what you really enjoy doing. It takes time. Just because I'm studying political science doesn't mean I'm going to become the prime minister or become a politician. I studied political science as well. I studied economics, but my love was literature. My love was writing, traveling. I spent my entire you know, study period, I was in a boarding school when I was growing up, and the study period, I never did my homework. I managed, I don't know how, but my entire study period was with an atlas open. So everybody thought I was studying because it's an atlas. It's a study thing eventually. But what was I doing? I was looking at all the places in the map. I said, my God, that sounds like such an interesting place to go to. This is such a great place to go. I want to go there. So my passion for travel started really early in life. And I wanted to go out there. Not because I have to tag somebody along. Who's going with you? How are you going? I don't want that. But I traveled. Now I'm on Google Earth. All the same things, but associating with pictures. But I have to be grateful to a friend of mine to encourage the ability in me to travel alone. Uh, Kanan, thank you. Uh, he was traveling with me down to Dehradun, and he decided I have to ditch this one out. And he said, you know, you can come back alone. I am going back home. And that was it. And I said, what? You mean to say I have to drive back all the way alone from Dehradun to Delhi? And he said, I don't know, but do it. I'm going. So he left me stranded in Dehradun. I have a white Maruti Swift and I have to drive it down alone to Delhi. I had never done this entirely in my life and I did it. So now what am I doing? I drove down early this year from Burgaon to Pondicherry all alone, clocking about 5,000 plus miles. <laughs> then I took a bunch of people who wanted to go on a road trip. We did an entire Ladakh, Jammu Kashmir thing with five awesome people and we learned a lot, another trip. I've done a Vizag uh, Vishakhapatnam to Burgaon alone on a jeep clocking 3,000 miles. So it's all right, just get out there let yourself be subject to possibilities that are there for you. Don't burn yourself up thinking what will people say. They will always find something more interesting to say tomorrow. Just go, glow and grow. Thank you.